putting Bitcoin in there in replacement of gold is the ultimate and final solution. I just don't think the sovereigns are ready to do that because they don't have enough Bitcoin. That begs the question, how do they get that Bitcoin? How do they get the last less than 2 million coins now, right? right? How do they get the last 2 million coins? And what does the value of those last 2 million coins have to be in order for them to do global trade? I think they will try and print. This is global settlement 1.0. 2.0 is why are we screwing around with gold? Let's start to use Bitcoin as a settlement layer. But Bitcoin has to get a lot bigger, right? Per coin, per sat, has to get a lot, lot bigger to in order to settle global trade. And these countries have to have, and I think they're already starting, right? The rumors are they're starting to accumulate, right? And some of them are not even rumors, right? We know Saudi Arabia is building mining capacity, right? I think this is where like Ray Dalio gets it wrong. I love everything Ray Dalio said about the changing world order, except for this one concept that bing bong i am back with another edition of the state of bitcoin podcast where i've got the man the myth the legend paul tarantino in the house but first he gave a great talk the other day and i just heard him on cedric's podcast talking about the last currency standing and we've had a lot of things come out in the news lately especially with trump and his all uh his candidacy and his party talking about putting Bitcoin on the back of the dollar and potentially utilizing Bitcoin to get the U.S. out of its debt situation. So, Paul, I'll start it with you right on the bat. First off, how are you doing? And do you think that's going to be the way the U.S. can solve the debt problem? Well, nice to be here, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Um, this is a, <laughs> it's an interesting topic. I don't I don't know how serious he is about that. Obviously, actually, uh, the first I've heard about it is because of, of your comments there. So um, all the only thing I can say about this topic is that I have often looked at Bitcoin as the free market bank or do you know what the bank or was uh, for anybody in the audience who doesn't like the bank or was uh, Keen's initial proposal, right, to have like this basket of international currencies that was the international settlement layer and so all these countries all the individual sovereign countries would manage their currency against the bank or and they do international trade against the bank or right so uh, of course the problem with that is it could be manipulated it was controlled by a central party but if bitcoin emerged as the settlement layer, right? As it merged as the currency, the free market version of the bank or that all other currencies had to settle against, then you would be holding the entire globe accountable for their own financial uh, diligence or mis uh, uh, or overprinting, let's just call it that. So the fact that Trump might want to use Bitcoin as a regulator against fiat money printing is an interesting uh an interesting topic because number one it would it would immediately put us in a position from the government's perspective where we would have to we'd probably have to default right because that would be uh, massive financial and fiscal responsibility otherwise bitcoin would become so expensive relative to the dollar that they you couldn't you couldn't trade with the rest of the world, so I I'm not I'm not really sure if that's as much a talking point as it is a reality, um, but certainly you know you, you, if things get bad enough, we start to default on our debts, uh, then it's 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 a great it's sort of the solution right, it is it is you know. Um, as long as they're not confiscating it from us to get those Bitcoin, <laughs> right? If, if if they got heavily into mining, if they took the Jason Lowry route and they went heavily into mining and the United States started to accumulate its own Bitcoin, uh, you tried to shore up the balance sheet that way, similar to the way we did when they confiscated gold, uh, then, yeah, our asset to debt ratio would improve. That would be a net positive. Um so hopefully they just they do it through proof of work, not through proof of seizure. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and hey, they, it's interesting you say that because, you know, they've just started selling off the, the Mount Gox coins. Uh, there's been a lot of seizures of, you know, Bitcoin that the U.S. government allegedly has been selling off or selling to exchanges. So I don't know. I mean, it seems it, it is an interesting thought experiment. I mean, we had we yeah. did already have like RFK Jr., uh, come out and say that he would like to back the dollar by, you know, hard assets and Bitcoin being one of those hard assets. But to mm -hmm. me, it seems like in a four year period, uh, that doesn't seem exactly super feasible and, uh, you right. know, it would flip things on its head. So I don't know. Do you do you see that uh, that as a possible path forward? I, I see that. I see that as an end game. I see that as the end game. I think they will try and print. I think I think the first step will be, you know, repress interest rates, print a lot of money, create inflation, try and get the debt to GDP, you know, in order through inflation because it's the only way they can do it. Uh, and then once once we're there, it becomes this global competition, right? If the BRICS are going to use gold as the settlement layer for all of their currencies. Then does the U.S. come in and use Bitcoin as a settlement layer if you want to trade against the United States? Like, do we just move the bar higher? Because I always saw gold, this this BRICS movement where gold is a settlement layer that's that's emerging right now is sort of step one uh, to the inevitable step two, which is Bitcoin as a settlement layer, because it's so much easier to settle with Bitcoin. Right. So if, if if you have all these uh, countries around the world settling all their trade in their own currencies, but then pegging out to gold to make sure that that value is not hyperinflated away by any giving trading partner, that pegging out to gold is great, except you have to trust the vaults. You have to trust the entities holding your gold. You have to trust central parties. We all know how how well that works. Right. So so putting Bitcoin in there in replacement of gold is the ultimate and final solution. I just don't think the sovereigns are ready to do that because they don't have enough Bitcoin. So it just because it begs the question, how do they get that Bitcoin? How do they get the last, I don't know, it's less than 2 million coins now, right? But how do they get the last 2 million coins? And what does the value of those last 2 million coins have to be in order for them to do global trade? That's insane to think about if, if, you know, you're a pleb that's been holding any any amount of Bitcoin. Um, but I don't know. Well, how, it, it, does it become a global, you know, I'm going to outdo you kind of uh, uh, race that I mean, that that's going to be great for Bitcoiners. I mean, that's going to be that'll be phenomenal. I just tend to think the governments uh, aren't going to do that until they're prepared and it's it's going to benefit them. So if if there, if we are in the United States, somehow moving towards um, proof of work, mining Bitcoin, being pro Bitcoin, accepting tax, do, doing all the right things by our citizens in order to accumulate Bitcoin on at, at uh, the balance sheet of commercial banks. Uh, I mean, the balance sheet of the Fed. That's that seems like I, I couldn't even fathom that. But um, you know, we'll we'll see if 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 we can get to that point. And I think we do. It's just like, I agree with you. It's really hard to see that happening in the next you know, four years, four year term. Yeah. Regardless I mean, of what the intentions are, but just having, having a, a candidate and a president, even just bringing that up is incredibly positive for the future of Bitcoin. It's what a lot of us it's, it's kind of game theoried out would happen. Um, you know, it, it, but I think also Bitcoiners are also uh, me included sort of, pessimistic in general which is wh why we found bitcoin to begin with and and so that uh that pessimism always keeps a little bit of like you know looking over your shoulder because you, you just don't trust the powers that be yeah and, but but with that um you know d do you think that this being a conversation and a talking point to a lot of candidates um you know trump rfk and then even biden kind of st starting to flip the script a little bit on bitcoin and and crypto to a lesser extent do you think that's almost admitting weakness in the dollar and that they they see the writing on the wall um and they're almost yeah. starting to say the quiet parts out loud um maybe behind closed doors i mean it, on the surface i think it just means that they they see it as store of value uh they, they see it like gold 2.0 
which is a great starting point, right? It, it's 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 if that's uh, orange pulling the government, perfect. Let's come on in. You know, store value is great. Um, but eventually, I think the positive outcome of that is that once they're faced with how do we accumulate more coins, then they need to get coins in circulation. They need to get taxes. They need to get taxes paid to Bitcoin, right? They they have to have a spending. So can, do they do that through uh, Bitcoin then becoming a um, a unit of account? That that that's when things start to shift, right? So I, I think that that would be the positive outcome for moving the United States more towards like an El Salvador model. Um, you know, but but there's it just depends on on the route they take to collect the coin. <laughs> yeah, no, and I and I none of us want to have our Bitcoin confiscated, right? Yeah, I know. So obviously holding it in a very private and secure manner is is is, is really important. But you mentioned the El Salvador model, and I kind of mm -hmm. want to dive into that a little bit sure. more because um, you know, with El Salvador, I would say probably 10 to 15 percent of merchants last time I went accept Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but everything's still priced in dollars. Sure. Now, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to make you uh, or put you on the spot here with a little prediction. Uh, how long do you think until El Salvador starts pricing in sats opposed mm -hmm. to pricing in dollars? Because, you know, even though we're still in, um, you know, the dollar as a global reserve currency, if it's legal tender there, you know, technically they could price everything in sats, right? Or at least that's my understanding. Um, Are you looking for the best way to store your seed phrase? Well, I've got it for you. It's Stamp Seed. They've got the number one punch place where you can order a full on package where they've got every single thing. They've got all the letters. You could just get it in there. And they've got this sick, sick hammer, which they've engineered to make it so easy for you to punch in that titanium steel plate and store your seed phrase in the most secure way possible. So go ahead and get your Bitcoin off of these exchanges and use promo code Green Candle for 15% off. They're helping power the show. They've got the uh, Bitcoin logo. You can punch it into your seed phrase as well. If you could see it here, they've got a lot of cool stuff. And now I'm helping empower you to get your Bitcoin off an exchange utilizing Stamp Seed and storing your seed phrase in the most secure way possible. Now get to it. All right, back to the show. I, I think that's a long ways away, honestly, because of the volatility associated with Bitcoin. And the once you understand the game, right? And, and there's a lot of education. I've spent some time in El Salvador. There's a lot of education that needs to take place at the gra grassroots level. But once you understand the game of holding Bitcoin and being able to convert to dollars in El Salvador for purchases um, over the long term, that that's massively beneficial to their economy and their growth. Right. So, the, I mean, they need to build up. They need their they need 70 percent of their population to get a bank account. They need 77 or 70 percent of their population to have some sort of savings. So if, if Bitcoin can accelerate savings, which we all know it does, uh, and they can do a tax-free conversion. And I know Naiba Kali is moving uh, by connecting the central bank to FinTech. He's moving in a direction where he'll expedite the conversion without having to pay high fees, the conversion of Bitcoin to dollars. I, I think that's a, a, a really good model right now for trying to build up their country. Eventually, I, you know, I think once we get, you start thinking out 10, 20, 30, 40 years, however long it takes, and we start to get to compressed volatility in Bitcoin because of mass adoption, because the coins are more greatly distributed amongst the populace. Um, that and or we have currencies pegged to Bitcoin, right? I think we then could start to see things priced in sats. I know that uh, Maya, um, who's who's running for president in Suriname, I believe she's talking about um, converting to the, the entire country to uh, sats uh, pricing, essentially Bitcoin 
a Bitcoin standard where everything's priced in sats. And that could be the very first country that does it, I think. I think they have an opportunity because they're so small and because inflation is so massive and because they import so so many goods right now eventually i think they'll they'll be a big exporter i mean they're exporting gold and they have a potential to export a lot of oil and gold and oil right become right now um is, is sort of these are sort of like the energy currencies of the world bitcoin is the emerging energy currency of the world so so having those those three in alignment I think she's got probably better potential than any other country right now to be the first to price everything as sats and be on a complete Bitcoin standard. And then everything, you know, and I know her her goal is anything that she, her country, her citizens would be purchasing, importing, would be getting cheaper in time. Right. And so uh, I think they have a good chance to do it far better than El Salvador. Well, it's interesting you say that because it's, it's cheaper in time, right? Because everything is priced in sats for, and, you know, uh, Bitcoin is deflationary in yeah. some sense. I mean, you could argue, you know, stagflationary, what have you. But, I mean, you, you brought up the volatility aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And what is it going to take to shift that mindset of the volatility aspect of Bitcoin? Because it's not necessarily Bitcoin that's volatile, right? I mean, it's, right. it's a dollar. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so what's what's it going to take to shift that? Because, I mean, is it going to uh, take a country like Sarnan? Price, pricing, pricing oil and Bitcoin. Pricing oil, pricing oil and Bitcoin would change everything. Because then, then your currency would be volatile relative to this energy money. Right. So I, I that could completely throw the game theory into hyperdrive. Right. And, and just move everything forward a lot faster. So Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, so let's, let's, I mean, play that out, right? Trump says, hey, we're going to back uh, the dollar with Bitcoin. And Saudi Arabia and Russia say, like, great, we're going to price oil and Bitcoin. Because there's this competition who can collect Bitcoin globally, right? Who can collect it? Um, then it would make sense. Instead of trying to compete with Bitcoin, Right. If you have to import anything, you're importing oil is the co base component of everything on the planet. Right. So that we consume. So if you're having to buy oil and Bitcoin, then it makes very little sense for you to have any currency other than Bitcoin in your country so that you can keep up. Right. With the uh, so that you're in, in alignment with the base input to everything you produce. Now there, that's a that's an interesting play out play out right. But there. how do you get how do you get all the individuals who have no Bitcoin? Yeah, to get I there, mean, right? It's it's a transition either way, but yeah, uh, certainly pricing oil and Bitcoin would would accelerate things a lot faster. A hundred percent, and you but know that's a that a rapid shift like that would be it would throw a lot of the world into a tailspin, a massive tail. So I just don't I don't see. I see it happening. I just, I think for the sake of benefiting, right? We want, we want Bitcoin to benefit the entire world. We want Bitcoin to become the thing that improves humanity's existence, that restricts government, restricts war, gives everybody the abundance so they can afford food, they can afford water, they can afford energy. They can afford the lifestyle they deserve as a human on this planet, right? That's the that is the goal in my mind of Bitcoin. We if if we do this for ourselves and we don't bring the rest of humanity along with us, uh, then we become the evil overlords. We don't want to do that, right? We want so there's this balance between green candle <laughs> and and you know. Let's let's get as many people into the system as possible before we get the Omega candle, right? So um, it's a it's it's you know yeah of course instinctually you're like yeah let's go let's go let's a million dollars a coin tomorrow right now let's go, but man that would cause a lot of pain for a lot of people too. Although you know the the correction to that is eliminate taxes on Bitcoin. 
incentivize these new billionaires to spend their Bitcoin and disperse the Bitcoin across the planet. Um, and so in, in the sense that Bitcoin can incentivize uh, eliminating taxation, that's huge. And that, that's a game changer that I don't hear people talking about. But when you play out that game theory of how Bitcoin evolves, rational minds would move towards extraction doesn't work. Only incentives work. So let's incentivize these Bitcoiners to spend, to build, to disperse their coins to the rest of the planet. But I just I just worry about that gap between you know, the, the massive pump and getting coins to these people and politicians, powers of be having to figure this out, right? We've had the luxury of thinking about this a lot and, and, and then the Bitcoin community theorizing how this could play out. They're just, they were, they're where, uh, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners were in 14, 15 and 16 that have, haven't thought too much further yet, right? They're, they're now, they're just now thinking like, Oh, Bitcoin, good. Okay, so so Solana and Ethereum is good too, <laughs> you know. And they're, they're missing the entire, uh, they're missing the forest for the trees. So we'll see. Yeah, and I mean uh, exactly to your point, right? RFK, he went and spoke at the Bitcoin conference last year. He spoke at uh, ETH Denver too, and he said, you know, after the Bitcoin conference, mm -hmm. he's going to buy Bitcoin, and after the ETH conference, he's going to buy ETH too. So. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I still think they're kind of missing the boat a little bit, but uh, it's encouraging that they're talking about it and kind of learning about it as well. But you yeah. brought up like oil, right? It was like a rumor floating around that Saudi ended their contract to to sell oil in the U.S. dollar and that kind of stuff. Sure. And it was kind of like a, a viral thing going around. I don't think it works like that from everything that I was reading and researching. But um, there's also rumors that the BRICS nations were going to create their own cryptocurrency and back it by gold uh, to start trading oil. So, I mean, you know, with all these rumblings, right, nothing has been coming to action. Do you think that this is actually, I, I guess, feasible to do a quick 180 shift like that to, to trade oil away or trade oil not in the U.S. dollar? Because I'll play devil's advocate with you here because it, it seems like, all right, if you trade with saudi or one other country uh to get oil in their currency you're basically going to purchase their currency buy the oil and then saudi in, a, in order to trade with anything else they need to convert their currency into a dollar in order to move that around so are you looking for the easiest way to get your bitcoin off an exchange well i've got it for you it's foundation devices they've got the number one hardware wallet in the passport they've even got a concierge service that can help you get your bitcoin off an exchange within one hour private onboarding session and they've got a great app too which will give you extremely 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 private features on that app so you can use Bitcoin in the most secure way possible. So I've been working hard trying to get sponsors to help you get your Bitcoin off an exchange. And I found it with Foundation. And you can store your seed phrase with a stamp seed punch plate as well. So pair all those together. Use promo code GREENCANDLE at foundation.xyz and you'll get $10 off your entire order. All right. That's enough for me. Back to the show. Yeah. You know, so that, yeah, that, those are all good those are all good um, observations. And actually, if you, if, you, if you just look into it, and if anybody's interested in, in getting a, a really like microscopic view of all this stuff that's going on, I think Luke Groman does an amazing job on all these topics. And if you're not subscribed to Luke Groman and you're into macro, you're completely missing out. So that would be a recommendation. Um, but, you know, Saudi not, it's not, they just didn't renew this sort of contract to sell oil in the dollar. It's kind of a non-event because they are already selling oil for other currencies. They were already, they had already broke the contract. Um, so, so, and also, it's also a misnomer to say that the BRICS want to create a gold backed currency. It's not, it's not gold backed. It's just, it's gold settled. So, so what Saudi is doing, what Russia is doing, is that they're selling oil in whichever currency their trading partner partner wants to pay in. And so, let's say, for example, China wants to buy oil from Russia. Russia accepts yuan. 
Russia then takes that yuan, sends it back to buy uh, T-shirts, cars, cell phones, and other, uh, and other uh, electronic parts, whatever. Any yuan that they're left with that they couldn't trade for goods that they, they need to bring into their country is then converted to gold. Right. So the question becomes is that where where is it converted to gold and where is that gold sitting? Right. So uh, China has built a massive gold exchange in order to facilitate this kind of trade because China doesn't want to open up their capital account. They don't want to. And a little little side note, I think this is where like Ray Dalio gets it wrong. I love everything Ray Dalio said about um, the changing world order, except for this one concept that, that China is going to open up their capital account and, and they want to be the next world reserve currency. At least for the, for the foreseeable future, they don't want to be the world reserve currency. They see all the problems with that. Instead, they want to do trade and they want trading partners and that they know that their economy is better and they are more secure the more trading partners they have in the world right so they're they're simply they're keeping their capital account closed in other words they're going to manipulate their currency right and they're going to manipulate it to however it benefits their country and so if you're russia or you're doing trade with china and you're getting payments you're saudi arabia you're getting a payment in yuan you don't want to hold the yuan because there's always the risk that China is going to devalue the currency in order to be a more aggressive trading partner around the world. So you're going to settle it out to gold immediately. So you send that yuan back to China and you buy gold. This was it sitting in a gold vault in China. And you're going to have a balance of gold on an exchange in China. You got to go get that eventually, right? That's a lot of money. That's a lot of expense. Right. And this goes back to our previous conversation. So this is why this is this is global settlement 1.0. 2.0 is why are we screwing around with gold? Let's start to use Bitcoin as a settlement layer. It, but Bitcoin has to get a lot bigger, right? Per coin, per sat has to get a lot, lot bigger to in order to settle global trade. And these countries have to have, and I think they're already starting, right? The rumors are they're starting to accumulate, right? And some of them are not even rumors, right? We know Saudi Arabia is building mining capacity, right? So uh, and there's lots of rumors that other, other countries are, are moving in that direction, right? So if, if these, these big sovereign trading partners start to build up enough Bitcoin and they start to Bitcoin has a high enough price that they can start to facilitate global settlement in Bitcoin, then they are forced to manage their individual country's currency against Bitcoin. Meaning if they inflate their currency to pay for a war, then it's going to make it more expensive to trade globally with anybody who's being fiscally responsible with their currency relative to Bitcoin. And then that starts to incentivize, well, maybe I should not be pegged to the dollar because they're they're inflating. Maybe I should be pegged to Bitcoin. Or maybe I need to be much more responsible so that I can afford to buy oil from Russia, so I can afford to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, right? So that it, this is the game theory of Bitcoin that benefits all of humanity because it, it drives, if you have any little bit of Bitcoin, it drives the future cost of all those core uh, commodities down relative to the value of your coins, right? This is the deflationary value of Bitcoin, right? You know, we currently live in an inflationary world because we have a debt-based money. Bitcoin being nobody else's liability, being a proof of work currency, and you, you're either going to mine it, earn it, Buy it. You got. You got to put some energy and effort out to accumulate this stuff. So it's no one else's liability. Once you have that relative to a debt-based currency, that debt-based currency is always is under the pressure of deflation, or always under the pressure of inflation, because 
the deflationary first forces want to collapse the debt. And so these, these central banks are going to keep inflating or keep printing to drive the value of that currency down and the goods and services up. And so if you have Bitcoin, it's always going to be purchasing more and more and more of a debt-based currency. So this is the, that game theory that flips the, flips the table, right? Pulls the rug out from under the central banks because they have no, they have no choice once people start to save at mass in Bitcoin because they realize it makes their life more affordable. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, but you, you talked about the central banks and I kind of want to dive into that a little bit more because you brought up China, right? China has been purchasing gold for the past two decades at a rapid rate. And it's, it's interesting because you've seen the gold ETFs actually seeing uh, net outflows like pretty consistently for the past three or four years. Uh, but the gold price has nearly doubled because central banks are buying up uh, gold. Well, I have a theory that this, the Bitcoin ETFs that just launched in the US, this is kind of the future of what's going to happen there is that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of traditional finances is, is dumping money into these ETFs currently, but eventually we're going to see net outflows of the ETFs and Bitcoin's price is still going to be shooting up because central banks are going to start, it's going to come out that central banks are going to start buying Bitcoin. Now, do you think that's just a, uh, you know, do you, do you see that as part of the game theory as well? Or do you think I'm just, uh, yeah, I guess blowing mm. some hot air here. Are you looking for the number one place to find all the information you can about Bitcoin, whether it's price, whether it's hash rate, whether it's the latest up to date things outside of Bitcoin, whether it's nation state adoption, what have you? Well, I've got the place for you. Check out bitcoinnews.com. They've even got the number one newsletter in the game when it comes to Bitcoin because it gives you all the up-to-date information on every single thing that happened in the past week that'll come to your inbox every single Monday morning. You could sign up using this code right down here or this link. It's also in the show notes. So come join me and thousands and thousands of other people that are getting the most up-to-date information from BitcoinNews.com in their newsletter all right let's get back to the show I, I don't know i've always looked at bitcoin as killing central banks right i you know i think once a government realizes that bitcoin can replace the need for a central bank once they get off the debt base a debt-based monetary system you don't need a central bank so so i i saw it as the the killer app that takes central banks out of the equation and that's also what I'm hopeful for. <laughs> so um, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I mean, if you look at the way central banks operate, I, I don't see why, I mean, that's a completely different business model for them. I don't, I, you know, they're in the, they're in the business of creating money out of thin air, which impoverishes the people of the country and those closest to the money printer get more wealthy, right? So the closer you are to the central bank, the wealthier you get. And the entities that uh, had developed this idea of central banking are getting the wealthiest and it's maintaining their wealth while they impoverish others, right? So it's a, it's a tool, it's a tool that allows, uh, allows you to enslave people without people having any idea it's even happening, right? Bitcoiners figured it out. Others have figured it out. Bitcoiners are trying to pull the rug out from under the central bank. Others have just said, oh, well, I need to get as close to the central bank as possible. I mean, but the central bank is just one giant bribery machine. One giant fiat Ponzi scheme, right? So if they start buying Bitcoin, they're going to kill themselves. This is, it's like, taking the poison pill. I, I, I don't see it happening. I, I, I could be missing something completely. I haven't really thought about it other than that, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't think it fits with their, their true agenda, which is impoverishment of the people for Bitcoin's true agenda is to create abundance for people. So it's antithetical to what they're all about. 
Yeah, I mean, the only reason I, I see it is because it'll be like a last ditch effort because I see kind of, um, you know, two two avenues to get to hyper Bitcoinization. And I'm, I'm curious on, on how you see we get it there. I okay. see one as like a very slow transition into it where we maybe have the dollar backed by Bitcoin or something like that. And then people realize, OK, even with that, they're still printing a bunch and devaluing the currency against Bitcoin and and all that kind of stuff. And eventually we get to a hyper Bitcoinization world. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of things, we have the current system crash and burn. And then, you know, and then, you know, maybe it's decades of repairing and we get to that uh, hyper Bitcoinization standard, which I think that would be or a Bitcoin standard. Excuse me. I think that would be a little bit more bloodier and a little bit more, you know, dangerous and, and, and things like that. But I mean, the way things are going, I don't I don't really know which way we see. I'm hopeful that it's more of a slower transition. But I mean, the Parker Lewis theory gradually, then suddenly you never yeah. know what can kind of happen. So how do you see us getting to a hyper Bitcoinized world or a Bitcoin standard? Sure. Um, OK, so I, I have to have a general theory in life that nothing gets fixed until it's broken. That's just human nature and human nature sort of guides all these things. So to me, um, we are going to uh, basically hyperinflate until we have a financial collapse. That financial collapse is going to open up everybody's mind to alternatives. There'll be a number of people who figure out Bitcoin and, and get to safety, get on the life raft, as people like to say, prior to the collapse. And there'll be others that, that don't go until they're until some power to be says, you need to go to that life raft, right? Um, but that general idea that, that nothing gets fixed unless it's, unless it's broken leads me to believe a gradually then suddenly route. And, and I think, you know, Jeff Booth does a really good job of describing sort of the, the bigger conflict that leads to the breaking, which is this battle between deflation and inflation. Everything in a free market is, is deflationary, right? Meaning everything that we're producing, if you, if you, right, you're going to, your podcast, you're going to try and do your podcast better and more efficiently and make more money than anybody else. Maybe you can deliver better content cheaper, faster, whatever it might be. So everything is deflationary. Everything in, in a free market is deflationary. When you juxtapose that against a debt based monetary system, it 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 the, it will collapse the monetary system. Okay, so and so if you start to think about why that that is, every uh, dollar in existence has a corresponding debt, right? That's how the dollars come into existence, right? So in order for you to be successful, you've got to outcompete somebody else so that you can pay off your debt. But you're taking those gains from somebody else and then they can't pay their debt right so so their debt defaults you're successful right so it's it's this zero-sum game unless we have inflation right so now th this is a radical oversimplification just so people can can grok it but if you if you think about that as just this zero-sum game of all these people competing for a fixed money supply that has equal corresponding debt, then every dollar that comes in the system is also being defaulted out of the system as people win and lose in this battle, which is why in a debt-based monetary system, they're always targeting some inflation rate. Because in order for growth to persist and for them to extract wealth while you're spinning your wheels, they need to have an inflation rate, right? They need to have new money coming into the system constantly in order for to get this perceived value of growth, okay? And that, that inflation always coming in allows them to extract it, extract it, extract it. Now, in this debt-based monetary system, right, how do you, you can, you can have no new, no new economic activity and still get growth through inflation, right? Because if you've got, and I like to use the weight and measure scale, right? You've got all the goods and services in the world, what they're priced at, and you have 
uh, dollars over here that give it that price. So here's everything you want to buy. Here's all the dollars in existence, and they are equal on this scale. If you have an inflation rate, you got new money coming in all the time onto the scale. It's driving prices of all the things you want to buy up. And that, if prices are going up, you're going to get higher GDP. You're going to higher GDP growth. You do this exact same economic activity at a higher price, you're going to get a higher GDP. Right? So they can engineer growth. So here we at the coming out of COVID, right? We have massive GDP growth, right? We're corresponding with massive inflation. We know that there's they just look around. It's the prices of things going up. It's not like uh, I, I'm looking around the world going, oh, like every, all my friends are making more money. They're they're all getting higher paid jobs. And no, it's not happening. It's just the price of stuff going up, right? So you can engineer GDP growth. China has mastered engineering GDP growth, right? So, and if and it and if deflation comes into the system, meaning this deflationary force wants to lower the prices of goods and services, right? Now the currency starts to get more expensive relative to these prices of goods and services. You're going to get lower GDP. The debt has never gone away because these dollars equal debt. So if the debt's never gone away and you're getting lower GDP, it's harder and harder and harder and harder for the government to tax it to pay down the debt. Right. And eventually the debt gets so big from def relative to GDP because of deflation that it breaks the debt based monetary system. Right. So now that requires a, more money printing. Right? If we're going to get this much deflation, we need to print more and more money to lift, to lift the price of goods and services again so that the debt to GDP are back in alignment. So because of that model, because deflation is a natural force, because we're in a debt-based monetary system, because it requires more printing to keep the GDP growth up. That's why hyperinflation becomes inevitable in a fiat-based money system, right? So yeah, this stuff can go like this for decades and decades and decades. But when the debt gets too big relative to GDP, then the game is is like near near end, right? Which is where we're at. So I think we will hyperinflate and break the economy and that's going to force the last currency standing that's the everyone's going to look around what's the where's the one place i can put my wealth to survive and they're going to find bitcoin they're going to be forced right that's why argentinians find bitcoin first venezuelans find bitcoin first africans nigerians find bitcoin first right the the more you understand inflation and deflation where you understand that 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 movement back and forth the faster you find bitcoin or the faster you understand it right in the united states um there's very little incentive for a lot of wealthy people to figure out bitcoin right okay so now i start to think about what are the deflationary forces that are going to accelerate this accelerate the breaking of the system Right. The most obvious one is artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is looking at it, looking at cre the generating value at a scale at a uh, that is so massive with a price that is so cheap that it, it would crush GDP. It could it, it's a massive deflationary force. Something like, you know, the estimates are something like 30 to 70 percent of high paying knowledge workers could lose their job. In the next decade because of artificial intelligence so those salaries are gone all those goods and all, all the services that they provide all the the uh salaries that they get are replaced by a machine that a corporation could buy and deduct so that you know from their their tax revenue so you've got you've got all these these deflationary forces not only reducing the income to the population but which reduces taxes but also Dr uh, driving that same uh, production in a, in a format that's more tax efficient for the corporations. So less GDP, less tax revenue, massively deflationary. It requires more money printing. It requires 
more inflation to keep the debt-based monetary system going. But the ramifications are that food goes up, gas goes up, right? All these things that people need to survive go up. You create a massive divide between the haves and the have-nots. The people that are living pay to, pay, paycheck to paycheck can't afford to eat, can't afford to put gas in their car. Why they see these people that own assets getting incredibly wealthy, and that breaks the system, right? And then, and then we have to, then we go back to the very first beginning of this conversation. We question: Are we then? Do we have an administration that's like we have to confiscate wealth and redistribute it, or do we have an administration that's smart enough to say, okay, let's not tax? Bitcoin wealth. Let's not tax assets. Let's incentivize people to spend savings. Let's incentivize the wealthy to hire people, to build companies, to spend wealth in order to distribute wealth back into the economy. Right. And so that that so we are going to break the system. That's going to drive change. And then we're going to have to see. The, you know, do we make good decisions or do, do we make bad decisions? And who's in charge hopefully we have wealthy bitcoiners in charge of the government by then and we have people making good rational decisions about how to get this wealth back into the economy in a positive and productive manner in investing in lower energy sources and in investing in proper food production and investing in non-confiscational non-manipulative non-corruptive means of production right um which unfortunately fiat incentivizes all of that right when you have a system when you have a dollar system that's that's based on extracting wealth like sticking yourself in the middle the most efficient way to get fiat is to stick yourself in the middle of two trading partners and extract that wealth for a little labor and the more you can do that the more wealth you can accumulate and it is incentivized the massive financialization of everything, right? So it, it, when you have massive financialization, you have massive extraction, you have all these middlemen that are just pulling wealth out of the system for doing very little productive capacity. And hopefully when we get, we get to a Bitcoin system, all of that goes away or most of that goes away if we develop it properly and we're doing a lot more peer-to-peer -peer transactions. The only way we're going to do more peer-to-peer -peer transactions is to eliminate the taxation model, the regulation model uh, that we currently have, because all of those systems are built to keep Bitcoin, keep Lightning in this, this current model, this current regulatory system, which is all about middlemen extracting value. And, and Bitcoin is built to go around all that, but you're seeing companies leave the United States because they will end up in jail by going around that, right? So hope that either, either we have to have the foresight to kill that stuff now and let Bitcoin build the future or the system breaks and then we build it out of default the hard way because we have to rebuild. Yeah, and I mean, uh, so it seems like you the way you you see us getting to a full Bitcoin center is almost like the U.S. going through a, a Zimbabwe sort of you know deflation of their. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think it'll be that bad. Okay, I, 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 because we have we have so many creative, wealthy um, people. We also have a culture that's that's entrepreneurial, innovative. I just I just it's not going to be easy, but I think if there's any country on the planet that can do it that can dig themselves out of a catastrophe, it's the United States. But the only way we can do it is get the get the regulators out of the way. You have to get the middlemen, you have to get the value extractors out of the way, which is that's that's what regulators are, right? They add very little value other than building moats around existing um, monopolies. 
Yeah, no, hundred percent. And I mean, I, I think it's interesting too, because I mean, I've, I've spoken to a few other people where they think that the theory of what you're saying, like eliminating taxation, but also like selling governments on utilizing like renewable energy or energy that's accessible to them, balancing grids, all that with Bitcoin miners, you know, essentially you mm -hmm. would be mining for the, the government, then you could eliminate taxes on everything in that in that way, shape or form too. So, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, Bukele had the, the Bitcoin Island where mm -hmm. they're, you know, not going to be taxed on that island. I don't know how, how far along that project's going, but do you see that as kind of uh, the dystopian future of potentially like a Bitcoin world where no taxation from governments, more peer to peer transactions and uh, in a, in a, you know, I guess uh, in a dystopian world where, you know, at the Bitcoin standard, everything is almost like uncorruptible by money. Are you looking for the best way to orange pill your friends and family? Well, I've got a way for you that's got a little bit of a nostalgia factor. I've got Bitcoin trading cards. They've got the Genesis pack. I've got an open pack right here sitting here where you can hand out a bunch of these cards with some great, great artwork. We've got tyranny. We've got fear, uncertainty, and doubt right here, the FUD card. So we've got a lot of great things to teach you a bunch of lessons about Bitcoin in the current space. And they've even got some cool things of cool people even doing some stuff in the Bitcoin space. I've got the Bitcoin racing card here, even signed by my boy, Chris Primetime McKenzie. So you can get all of that at btc-tc.com. Use promo code Green Candle. You can get 10% off your entire order to orange pill your friends and family and collect some cool artwork of people that are doing some awesome stuff in the Bitcoin space and help spread that orange pill around the globe. All right, enough from me. Back to the show. Um, I'm I'm missing you on the dystopian vision there. To me, that well, sounds pretty good. Yeah, I, maybe I'm using the wrong. <laughs> maybe I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah, uh, using the wrong phrase. I, I apologize, but maybe no, no problem. Uh, like uh, this perfect. I don't know, like almost like Jetsons kind of world. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I I think that's where we're going. I mean, I, I know I, I, this entire podcast, right? I sound like a complete pessimist, but I, it's because I believe stuff has to break in order for us to rebuild it. So, yeah, I believe we build the George Jetson future. I think that George Jetson future, the green, right? This is the fourth turning model. That future is finally going to come. Low cost energy is going to come. Bitcoin is going to incentivize that quality food that's not poison is going to come because Bitcoin's going to incentivize that. Proper use of pharmaceuticals and medical treatment and or alternative therapies are going to come because Bitcoin's going to incentivize that. And how, why is that? Because as people move towards a Bitcoin standard, the only way you're going to extract their Bitcoin wealth is if you provide extreme value, right? Bitcoiners are already making this financial calculation today. They're already saying, if I'm going to compound my savings at 40, 50, 60, 70, 100% a year, right? Why or, or what has to come along as an alternative in order for me to sell some Bitcoin in order to accumulate this new alternative? I'm not going to sell Bitcoin for freaking Zithromax, right? That's like, I'll just take zinc, vitamin C and D and get, you know, exercise and eat good organic food, right? So uh, what I'm saying is, is that there are incredible things that can be done. Bitcoin is going to set the bar so high that only those incredible things will be able to come to market. There will be no market for garbage, which is 90% of what we consume today is complete garbage, right? Because our currency is losing purchasing power at a clip of 11% a year is the way we're calculating it, right? This is very interesting math, right? My friend Chris Sullivan at Hyperion, who's a hedge fund manager, did the, did the calculation on the value of the dollar. You've seen the long-term chart of the dollar and its losses of purchasing power. That's an average loss of 11 point something percent per year. 
Well, what what's the S and P five hundred's average return since the nineteen hundreds? Nine point something per year. So you're saying you could save save in the S and P five hundred and lose two percent purchasing power per year, and that is the primary savings vehicle for every American, right? So think about that, and ask yourself why you don't own Bitcoin. Or ask yourself, once you know the real math, why you invest in anything that doesn't go up by at least 20% a year. And there's very few things at the end of the day, right? This is why five stocks lead the S&P 500. Because the vast majority of things that you're told you should buy are garbage. That don't produce a lot of value. If once everybody's on a Bitcoin standard, that's going to be really hard to convince them to play with garbage. So that, that that is to me, this is like the massive positive takeaway that Bitcoin's just setting the standard so much higher because it's based on free market. It's based on understanding math, right? And and with fiat, math doesn't work, right? Math is is completely manipulated. So. I don't know. We, we kind of went off on a tangent there, but it, it's um, I I think it, it's going to be a really really positive takeaway for most people, uh, but unfortunately, I think a lot of people got to feel a lot of pain before they go this route. Um, and as as much as I preach and try and tell people what's coming and try and explain this to them, I mean, I've been talking to certain people in my circles for years. They haven't bought anything. I'm, I'm the same. Way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Some like, people I don't... are not going to get to, right? I mean, I, I, I'm the same way, but, um, you know, I think maybe the number go up this cycle, hopefully will be some head turners. I know COVID was some head turners yeah. uh, previously seeing all the inflation, you know, that we're feeling right now might be some head turn. I think just more and more touch points is what we need. And I think yeah. we're going to get there, but I agree with you. Uh, I think we might need to feel a little pain here in the interim. So, but you've been very generous with your time. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Why don't you tell people where they can find you and uh, more about Bi Bite Federal? Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm the director of business development uh, for Bite Federal. Bite Federal started as a, a Bitcoin ATM company. Um, they are evolving beyond that now. Uh, but as a Bitcoin ATM company, they took a different route in that they control their entire network. They build the, all their ATMs here in the United States. They've written all their software. Uh, they control it from soup to nuts. Um, now, as a part of that, uh, the benefit of, of owning that business all the way through from end to end, it's allowed them and it's given them the financial ability to build a lot of new technology. Um, and we have a massive amount of tech in the pipeline that's coming uh, from our wallet that just launched and is going to be dramatically improved here in the near future with on-ramping uh, buys and sells and global access uh, to a POS system that's uh, in beta and sl slowly being tested throughout the system through uh, uh, a real estate partnership where we'll be able to facilitate Bitcoin transactions for real estate. Uh, uh, we're adding, um, a, or we have headquarters that have been developed in El Salvador. That's just just getting ready to go, and in uh, Dubai. So a lot of good things in the future coming for Byte Federal, um, and very excited to roll this out uh, and and try and on ramp uh, more people into the Bitcoin ecosystem. So. That, that's that's the goal, as many as we can get into the system. And like you said, you never know where they're going to come from, right? And every cycle, we get more people. Um, but one of the, I'll leave you with this. One of the things I'm really positive about uh, for, for the world in general is that, you know, how many times you as a Bitcoiner look around the world and you see somebody uh, complaining about the COVID vaccine or the poison in their food or realizing that a conspiracy theory was accurate. All of these people are waking up in one spoke of the wheel. At the center of that wheel is Bitcoin. 
right? So it doesn't matter what spoke of the wheel you come in from, you become, you become a Bitcoiner. Once you understand that the system that you've been operating in is corrupted or you're, you're having value extracted or it doesn't, it just doesn't operate the way you thought it did. And you wake up to that fact, you get pulled into the center and then you discover at the core of all that is the corruption of money. And so every, you, this is why we as Bitcoiners go, oh, you're a Bitcoiner. You just don't know it yet. Right. Because we're seeing it happen in all these different parts of the economy all over the world and all different sectors. And these people will become Bitcoiners. It's just a matter of time. Amen. And I'll put all that in the show notes so you guys should all go check out Byte Federal and the great things they're doing. And Paul, thanks so much. Thanks, Brandon. Great to chat with you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this great episode. If you enjoyed this one and you want some more content, click on the link right here and check out my latest interview with Tom Luongo. We get into it all. If you've known Tom, he's a wild one, so stay tuned. And if you found some value in this podcast, please smash that like button, hit that subscribe button so you get notified of the next videos. All right, I'll catch you at the next one.